very interesting topic. So, okay. Yep. All righty. Welcome, everybody. Just, uh, my name is Gaurav Nigam, one of the ER physicians and hospitalist doctors here. Uh, today's topic would be supplements and uh, understanding whether they are helping us or hurting us in the long term. So first of all, for starters, how many of you here in the room use any supplements? <laughs> so today's topic will be probably very uh, helpful in terms of being relevant to what we are using in our day-to-day -day lives. Am I audible to the audience in the background? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So let's uh, let's crunch, uh, let's do a little disclaimer here. Uh, I am board certified in family medicine and sleep medicine, and uh, I do not have any financial ties with any pharmaceutical or nutraceutical industry. Uh, the views expressed in this talk will be entirely mine, and I do not and this does not represent the official stand of Clay County Hospital with regards to supplements. So first of all, let's crunch the numbers, like how big an industry the supplement industry has become. It has grown from uh, 52 billion in uh, the 1980s to a 121 billion industry uh, uh, in, 19, uh, in current days. And actually the projected uh, data says that it will go up to 278 billion in 2024, so clearly uh, it has grown uh, pretty much uh, almost quadrupled uh, in, in the next uh, 15 years, in the next 10 years or so. So lots of jobs and lots of, uh, as the numbers here show, the Council of Responsible Nutrition tells us that uh, it contributes 121.6 uh, billion to the U.S. economy, which is, which is a lot of numbers. So let's uh, first see, especially as we grow older, we feel the need that, okay, our kidneys are not working very well, our livers are not working very well. So we need to supplement and take extra in the food that we are eating, the <coughs> medications that we are using to be supplementing with additional chemicals or supplements as we call it. So this is a study that was published in JAMA in, 20, in 2016 actually. Uh, and sorry, the clicker, it doesn't point on the screen, I'm guessing, right? So, okay. So basically, uh, it means that uh, there has, if you look at the conclusions and relevance, I'm not sure if it's visible in the background or not, but as, it, as you can see, it says, since 2005, there, thank you, has been, uh, there has been 15%, uh, or I should say 15% of the older adults, which is people 65 and above, will have or potentially have uh, interactions with their medications. So they're taking prescription medications and then there is these nutraceuticals or supplements that we are taking. And those will in some sort interact and make it difficult for the medicine to work or overwork, which is called drug interactions. <coughs> so as we are uh, seeing the usage of prescription medications as well as dietary supplements has gone up since 2005, and that will result in more and more drug interactions, more and more falls, dizziness, and all the side effects that occur from these medications interacting with each other. And as you can see, they had studied all different kinds of medications, which, which like actually brings me uh, to the question before we go forward in uh, more slides. How many people here use uh, vitamin A supplements or have supplements that contain vitamin A? Okay, a few people. How about vitamin E? More people. Okay. How about vitamin D? Most of the people. Okay. How about calcium in the supplements? Lots of people. Wonderful. So we'll be talking about all those different molecules and whether, in what regard we should be taking them or not taking them and what dosages if we are taking it are considered uh, safe dosages. So uh, first let's define uh, what supplements stand for. So supplements are any active molecules, ingredients, nutrient uh, molecules that are not regulated by the FDA or the Food and the Drug Administration. And uh, what it means is that when a new molecule is introduced in the market, 
FDA won't have to do a proof of concept or a clearance or a registration for that molecule or uh, nutraceutical, and it is freely available to the general public. So what do you think are the downsides if something that is just produced in someone's kitchen and is available in, in a food co-op or somewhere? What are the main downsides that you would consider before like consuming them? Any downsides people can think of if there's no regulatory body that's controlling it? Exactly. So that's that's a term called misbranding. As you can see, the two. I don't. I'm not sure if you can see the fonts or not. But misbranding is what you exactly described. Like if they claim it's uh, fish oil and it contains omega threes, how do we know it contains omega threes when nobody, like a federal uh, drug institute, or nobody has actually looked into it? So that's a big problem. That's called misbranding. The other is adulteration, which means. Okay, you said that it contains omega-3. What if it contains some other molecules, like PCBs, or the polychlorinated biphenyls? That's a carcinogen molecule that is usually added for preservative value to omega-3s and different uh, fish oils. So there is not only misbranding, but also adulteration. The problem with this approach is that unless a person has had side effects and they reported it to the FDA, the FDA won't look into it. So we need to have some sort of uh, mishap or calamity before someone will take a look into it and take it off the market. So they have the authority, and that's called the DSHEA, or the Dietary Supplement Education, Health Education Act. Uh, basically it says that you are free to introduce these molecules, but they should be safe, and we are hoping they are safe. There's very few regulations looking into it. And if they are not safe, someone had a side effect, liver failure, kidney failure, someone died, either came to the ER because of drug interactions, then they will look into it if a complaint has been lodged by the consumers forum that, okay, maybe this was not safe and they will withdraw it. And they have withdrawn some molecules. But then the problem with this approach is it's retrospective and people have had the damages before it was withdrawn. So here's the, uh, I tried to kind of encapsulate all those different points. There's something called proof of concept, which means this molecule has to prove that it was working before we can allow it to be introduced in the market. And that's what happens with every single medicine, lisinopril, statins, whatever medications we take. It has been uh, gone through rigorous trials, randomized controlled trials, and people, it has worked in people and hopefully not killed the people, so they are still in the market and we're using it. But if there were damages or some sort of injuries, there has to be a black box warning, or there has, the drug is just not uh, considered safe to be using. There are instances where certain medications are considered safe in Europe, they're not used here, or we use them and they don't use it. So there's various regulatory bodies which define and delineate the risk factors which are permissible with regards to the benefits that we are getting from this medication. So there is no proof of concept for uh, supplements. It stands for the pharmaceutical industry. So clearly, uh, uh, they have an easy way there. Also, they don't need to be registered or cleared by the FDA before they're introduced in the market, just like we talked. Uh, FDA is not responsible for looking into the potency or the purity. If someone says, I'm going to put three milligrams melatonin in that capsule, God knows it contains five or one. Nobody nobody's has looked into it, and they are not expected to be looking into it. So it's totally upon the consumer to believe or use or just go by whatever uh, they think is the right criteria. But there's no way to 100% check whether they, they are pure or potent or not as to what the label says. And post-market surveillance. So this is more important. FDA doesn't need to do a post-market surveillance on all the, uh, all the supplements. But if someone lodges a complaint, then obviously they will look into it and then decide whether that case has merit or not. Any questions about all this distinction between medications and supplements? I thought it was very startling that they have such a easy way around introducing uh, supplements. That's why the supplement industry is booming, because there are not so many regulations, so it's easy to come up with a supplement, you know? So, some of the... Uh, the pitfalls with the usage of supplements. I think one of the biggest ones was just like uh, a lady in the crowd mentioned, mislabeling. You are telling us, okay, it contains omega-3s, it contains vitamin D, 
Is it really containing it? We don't know, so that is mislabeling. The second one is uh, what I call synergy, which means when we eat a carrot, carrot has a molecule called the beta carotene. So beta carotene is considered uh, the primary molecule or pre-vitamin A, and that is supposed to be helping with vision, skin integrity, mucosal membranes working, all that good stuff that vitamin A does. But that's not the only molecule that a carrot has. Carrot has alpha carotene, beta carotene, delta carotene, epsilon carotene. But when we buy the vitamin A supplement, the manufacturer, all they have done, they have isolated all the beta carotenes and concentrated it in a single pill and given it to us. Now, that is not a natural way a carrot would function. If the body eats a carrot, uh, then there is different kinds of carotenes all in harmony, and the body can pick and choose whichever it wants, and one can, tends to cancel the effect of the other if there is a need. So that's why the synergy or the harmony between the different macromolecules that is present in the natural food will be will be disturbed in a in a supplement, and that's why that's one of the biggest downsides of supplement. We are not getting the entire spectrum, but just one molecule in the spectrum that the carrot or the apple contains. Now, the other one is, of course, if they're effective or not, there's a lot of placebo effect, which means I believe it's working, so it's working, and, and, and people have that effect sometimes. We even do that with our medication. The patient tell us, okay, uh, medication B is working better than medication A. We might not have randomized trials to prove that, but hey, if it works for somebody, then it works. I mean. That's called placebo effect in medicine. Uh, they may not be cheap. I mean, some of these supplements are super expensive. So it's not like uh, we are going to save money buying the supplements. So there's still, we have to pay money for those. Now, one more additional one, uh, especially people who are applying for new jobs, <clears throat> if they have to go through drug clearance and stuff, some of these molecules will interact with medications that you are taking and that will create what we call false positives, which means you might test positive for morphine when you're not taking any morphine, and then, the, then you're like, where did this come in my system from? So it's important, at least when you are applying for a new job or something, and, and this happens with only certain molecules. I'm not saying like every vitamin D pill has it, but certain supplements have certain ingredients, what they call other ingredients, like titanium dioxide, magnesium silicate, coloring agents, preservatives, additives, fillers, which might be picked up in the urine drug screen or the blood drug screen. And you never took any uh, opiates or any, any narcotics or anything like that, and it's showing up in your system. And it's like, what is grandma who's like 80 years old doing with morphine? Doesn't make sense. But like, you know, I mean, it's it's very precarious situation. So there are a bunch of unbalanced chemicals, especially the ones that have not gone through rigorous testing, uh, and that creates a big problem, especially if you're applying for a new job. Now, I, I can challenge, and I, I've uh, uh, published almost 30 papers in uh, different journals. I can tell you for sure, not a single death has been reported from eating too many strawberries or apples. <laughs> but uh, lots of, I work in the ER, and you see lots of drug interactions from overdosages and even like taking normal dosages of the supplements and people have side effects from that. So I don't think we can go wrong eating fresh fruits and vegetables no matter what quantity we eat. But if we eat these chemicals, there's a good chance that some of us will suffer. So uh, we have to exercise caution is what I'm saying. We have to watch out what we are consuming and look at the labels. It's very important to see that what the labels are containing. First of all, there's always a number on the supplements if you look at the label. They have a number call if you have any questions. If you are hypervigilant, then just go ahead and call that number and ask for a certificate of analysis or COA, which means has someone analyzed the molecules that are being listed on the label? And if the person on the other end said, what is that? You have to hang up because clearly <laughs> nobody has looked into that to know what, what they are talking about. So that's a good way to know that. Clearly, this has uh, not gone through strong regulatory uh, restrictions and stuff like that. Now, watch for the list of other ingredients, which means molecules which are ancillary but are required for the preservation of the uh, chemical. These can be coloring agents, uh, preservatives, additives, 
fillers, you will see like titanium dioxide or uh, magnesium silicate. In some cases, there is FDNY coloring agent, uh, things like that. So gelatin. So you have to make sure they do not have like a whole paragraph explaining like we have these many preservatives because God only knows what that does to our body. Nobody has looked into it. So these are like new molecules. It's better not to have a, have a supplement that contains a long list of other ingredients. We just want the primary molecule to be the main ingredient. Now, uh, if you think they are saying it's a miracle drug, like some of Dr. Oz show, I mean, they say like people have lost a lot of weight or suddenly turned 30 years younger. I'm, I mean, that's a problem because FDA has said like supplements are meant to be supplements and they're not complements, which means that it's something that is supposed to support and promote a secondary line of defense. It's not something that will act on itself and cause radical changes in our body. So that's a problem. If they make like out of this world uh, promises, then probably they're not true because clearly we haven't still found any weight loss drug or a, a miracle youth promoting drug at this point. Now, as I said, the burden of responsibility is on FDA to prove that the medicine is harmful and not on the company to prove that the medicine is safe. So if something wrong happens, then only can action be taken. Otherwise, in pro, uh, it's only in retrospect after some damage. So if someone has lost a liver or lost their life, then probably a case can be made. So that's why it's a little uh, shaky ground to take a new supplement that's introduced in the market that has not been used by a lot of people. You don't want to be the first person using a new <laughs> supplement in the market for, for safety reasons. So we talked a lot about this slide. I'll skip the slide and, uh, to just save some time here. So the question is, uh, I, I've told you probably 90% bad things about supplements, only just 10% things which are helpful, or I should, I should say encouraging. Uh, if they are that bad, why are they not affecting us? Well, the fact is they are affecting us and we are not recognizing it. And also they're affecting everybody to different extents. Most of the supplements will be cleared by the liver. Some of them will be cleared by the kidneys. Those are the two main organs in the body that deal with the drugs that we consume on a regular basis. Now, this study that was done and published in British Journal of Pharmacology in 2003, that shows that every individual has a different rate of metabolism and the way they process the chemicals. Some of us have stronger livers, so if you give the same toxin dose, it's, it's just like smoking cigarettes. Two people smoke cigarettes, one person dies with lung cancer in 70, the other one is laughing and living till 100 and nothing has happened to him. So why is that discrepancy? Because toxins in the body they are processed differently by different people. And this was proved in this study. Uh, there is something called MPPGL, which is microsomal protein per gram of liver, which means how much uh, enzyme uh, capacity does the liver have per gram to remove toxins or metabolize or break down chemicals, which the body does not want to have in the first place. So everybody has different levels. And actually, uh, from birth to 28 years of age, it increases. And after 28 years, it slightly starts to taper, go down as we grow older. That's why in older people, as we get more older, we have more side effects from medications because our bodies are not clearing the medications. The more medications we take, the more drug interactions will happen. The more it will stick in our body, the more the side effects. Even in the ERs or in the hospitals, when we have people who are like 80 years old or 90 years old, we try to give them half the dose what we would give to a 20 year old because the medicine takes longer to clear from the body. So that's what it says. So it's the same for supplements. More is not essentially good because it sticks in our bodies longer, more chances of having side effects. Any questions about that? Alrighty, so this is, uh, the next slide is, uh, is one of the uh, good slides to take home uh, for today's lecture. This is uh, from the USPSTF, which is United States Preventative Services Task Force. This is the prime body that uh, sends out recommendations about screening, about uh, medications to be taken, which are not to be taken, and stuff like that. And if you look at the last line there, that's the most important part of this slide. 
that says use a beta carotene of vitamin E for prevention of cardiovascular disease and cancer. The task force recommends against the use of beta carotene or vitamin E supplements for prevention of cardiovascular disease or cancer. So what does that mean? That means on a regular basis, we should not be taking vitamin A or vitamin E pills unless our doctor has asked us to. And I'm not trying to undermine any doctor's intelligence here, but I went to med school six years and then uh, three years residency and fellowship after that. Let me tell you that we as doctors do not get any or minimal, probably a week if you do some rotation of education in nutrition. We are trained to be dealing with pharmaceuticals, which is medications. If you come to me, I have been trained to give you the blood pressure pills. If you come to me with high cholesterol, I have been tr trained to treat with statins. And that's one way of treating the problem, but that's not the uh, best way of treating the problem. And we do not get a lot of education about nutrition and nutraceuticals or supplements. So this is something you have to study from your own interest and look at stuff. There is evidence out there, but it's not a part of most curriculums in any med school. So that's the part of the problem why even some doctors don't know much about it and they would, they would just give you a very bland advice. So we have to be very cautious with use of these supplements. If we have clear cut deficiencies, if we have a low vitamin A level, obviously. It happens in developing countries where people have loss of vision from vitamin A deficiency in kids. Those are absolutely good reasons. But for using vitamin A and vitamin E on a regular basis to prevent cancer or heart disease does not work because it causes cancer and heart disease. That is the most startling thing I want to tell you today. Like vitamin A and vitamin E are risk supplements, not the natural form. No matter how much carrots you eat, never get cancer from eating carrots. But if you consistently, repeatedly take vitamin A or vitamin E, not vitamin D. Vitamin D has not been found to be causing any harm. But vitamin A and E have been linked with cancer, especially lung cancer for people who smoke or have been exposed to uh, asbestos. That's a huge risk for vitamin A, especially the evidence is much stronger for vitamin A. It's also there for E, actually. So my uh, earnest recommendation today is, if you do not have any signs of deficiency of vitamin A or E, which we do not have because we are not living in developing countries where they are not supplemented with vitamin A when they're born, uh, there is most, most cases do not require vitamin E. Why do we use them, vitamin E or vitamin E? We'll talk about it in a little bit more detail later. But that's, that's the take home point from today's lecture, that please do not on a regular basis take vitamin E. Or, so scan the list of nutrients on your, on your uh, labels, and they should not contain A or E. Iron is fine, folates are fine, omegas are okay, vitamin D is okay, calcium is okay, but A and E should not be taken on a regular basis. So, I've talked a lot about the bad, bad supplements. Let me talk a, good, a little bit about the good supplements, which at least there has evidence that are not causing harm. Benefits probably, but they're not causing harm. So number one on the list is melatonin. If you take melatonin supplements for sleep, some people even take it for blood pressure actually. It helps to reduce the blood pressure. But if you take it for sleep, it's a pretty good idea. And the dose, what I want you guys to remember is the dose. The dose is not, more is not good. If you take three milligrams or five milligrams, the max they do is five milligrams, which is a lot of melatonin. Um, as long as we do a lower dose, which is 0 0.1 milligram or 0 0.3 milligrams, that helps not only with sleep, it also helps with transatlantic or transcontinental flights. So if you're traveling like three time zones or six time zones from New York to LA, then it will help with the jet lag. And also it helps with night shift disorders and stuff like that. So melatonin is a good medication you can take on a regular basis. Higher dosages cause headaches. Lower doses are totally fine to be taken. Kids can use it as well. Now, what about vitamin D? Two things to notice about vitamin D. First is, uh, it's safe. In most cases it's safe. We have no... Again, if you look at one paper, you might find some evidence, but the evidence, the majority of the evidence, does not suggest that vitamin D is 
bad for us. There is some evidence that if you have toxicity, there is some uh, side effects you can have, but none like what vitamin A and E cause. So vitamin D is okay. Now which form of vitamin D? Please look at the label. If it contains D2, which can be alpha, uh, it can be alpha calciferol or uh, calcidiol, which is not what we want. We want vitamin D3. And D3 will be cholecalciferol, like C-H-O-L-E calciferol. So that would be one important thing. And D3 is good. D2 is, it's not harmful, it's not helping us actually. So if you are weak and tired and you're like, hey, I use vitamin D supplements, my vitamin D level goes low. And if you get it rechecked and it's still not helping or the numbers are better, but you're not feeling better, then you should check the label. There should be D3. Why is it important? Because when we go outside in the sun, which we should not, because it's zero degrees outside, <laughs> if we get a chance to go out in the sun, the exposure from the sunlight causes a natural conversion of the skin cholesterol into D3. So cholecalciferol or D3 is the natural synthesis of vitamin D in the body. Just like we talked about beta carotene being concentrated, it's not the same as carrots, so sunlight is not the same as calcium. Uh, D2. So D3 is what we need because that's the natural rhythm and that's what the body requires. Now I just put two different uh, uh, paper con conclusions from Cochrane Library. Cochrane Library is a big database that does like systematic reviews and meta-analyses of all the good stuff. Uh, some evidence suggests that oh it does not help with uh, hip fractures and some evidence is that it, it, sh it may help with hip fractures. So uh, it's the reason these two uh, slides are pretty, uh, a lot of information there, but the conclusions, if someone can read that from that far, basically it's saying, <laughs> it's basically saying that 400, looking at the dose, 400 might not be enough to protect from hip fractures or any other fractures. Uh, so the ideal dose is 800 for protecting us from fractures. So if you're taking a low dose, you have osteoporosis, probably it's, it's not hurting, but again, it's not helping, so what's the point, right? It's just causing more drug interactions. And uh, the study on the right was done in Norwegian, in Dutch women, and they used 400 and did not find any improvement or prevention of hip fractures. And the study on the right, this is in JAMA 2005, uh, this showed the difference between 400 and 800 international units. And 800 works better, and it works better if you take it with calcium, because Vitamin D increases the absorption of calcium from the gut. So, uh, vitamin D is safe for the most part. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes, so D is the generic way of, whenever we say vitamin D, I hope we are implying D3. But D is the generic form. The first conversion happens in the liver, it's called hydroxy vitamin D, and then the second one happens in the kidney, dihydroxy vitamin D. But vitamin D in general, for most practical purposes, it should mean D3, which is the form they should be taking. So these are uh, studies that were done on D3. Now, why did we, all this uh, uh, ruckus that has been created around using calcium, milk, and uh, milk is good for the bones and teeth, I'll come to that part, by the way. But basically, this is all based on a 1992 study published in, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, which is the most reputable journal in the world, has the highest impact factor. So uh, this journal found that women who are institutionalized, which means women who are living in nursing home, elderly women, when they were given vitamin D3, if you can look at the conclusion, it says supplementation with D3 and calcium reduces the risk of hip fractures and non-vertebral fractures among elderly women. So this is the main study from where we drew this idea that, okay, Vitamin D is good for us, calcium is good for us. And then we use that population study to generalize. Now, as we grow older, I'm totally on page with people taking calcium and vitamin D because our bones are getting weaker. Osteoporosis is age-related. The weakening of the bones, chances of having falls and fractures increases with vitamin D deficiency. So, so get your levels checked, first of all. And uh, the normal is considered 40. Even between 20 and 40, we call it vitamin D insufficiency. 
Uh, less than 20 obviously is vitamin D deficiency, but we want the levels to be between 40 and 100. We don't want the levels to be above 100 either because we want to be in the right range. But as long as we are above 40, we should be good. So this is the paper actually for American Commons. The idea was to tell you that when we are younger, we need less of vitamin D because we are more active and we are doing stress-bearing exercises and that's why our bones are stronger. But as we're growing older, the activity goes down so the supplementation becomes a little bit more important. What about folic acid? Well, if uh, women are pregnant, folic acid is a good idea. More they eat green leafy vegetables, the better it is. Again, the same idea of synergy. If you're getting it from the plants, from kale, from uh, broccoli, if you're getting it from the natural sources, it contains all the different variant forms and not the just one single form that is isolated and concentrated in a tablet. But folic acid is a good idea for people with anemia. It's a good idea for people with, uh, who are pregnant, I'm guessing. Okay, so another one uh, is B12 or cyanocobalamin. That's a vitamin that is taken mostly by people who are vegetarians or vegans, which means they are not consuming any animal source. This is one vitamin that the body cannot synthesize. Body can, uh, this is also not, I'm, I'm sorry, this is one vitamin that the plants cannot synthesize. We, we eat lots of vitamins that are from plant sources, A, B, C, D, E, everything, but vitamin uh, B12 is one vitamin which is produced by the bacteria in the soil and the rivers. In older times, people would drink water from the rivers and, and uh, they would just pull out acorns from the soil and eat them and there would be like particles of soil clinging and that had the bacteria that produces B12. But uh, nowadays everything is sterilized and we don't want to have cholera either, die from cholera drinking the real water. So it's, I think it's a good trade-off to have B12 deficiency and not get cholera. But uh, it does create a deficiency of B12 which manifests as anemia, neuropathy, tingling of uh, uh, arms and legs, things like that. So getting B12 checked is a good idea. Values usually should be between 200 and 900. Uh, if less than 200, it needs to be supplemented. And there are certain fortified foods like B12 fortified foods. Taking a shot of B12 is a good idea. I think it's done like once a month. We are pretty good with that stuff here in Clay County, I've noticed. But uh, a pill works as well if you have good absorption. If your absorption is not good, then the shot is the better way to go. Either way, you can track it with a B12 level. It's very easy and your physician can do that. <clears throat> uh, two groups of people should be especially careful about B12 deficiency. Any person who has diabetes and are taking metformin, glucophage kind of medications, their uh, B12 tends to run low because of the interaction. And the second is people who use any, uh, any reflux medications like pantoprazole or Nexium, uh, omeprazole, any of those medications because that will inhibit the absorption of B12. So for that reason, it's even more important to get your B12 checked. Okay, so now the last one. We talked about melatonin, vitamin D3, uh, talked about B12, folic acid. The last good one is yeast. Now, yeast can uh, naturally be found in uh, different forms like baker's yeast or brewer's yeast or nutritional yeast. And why is it such a good molecule? It's similar to, uh, earlier lecture we talked about butyrate. That's a molecule that's formed from fermentation of fibers. Uh, butyrate can be found in asparagus and all the uh, green leafy vegetables. And that is anti-inflammatory, which means it reduces the inflammation in the gut. So if people have irritable bowel syndrome, if they have any sort of chronic uh, gut problems, then the prebiotics, uh, the butyrate in the pre prebiotics helps. Similarly, the beta-glucans, that's the molecule that is found in the yeast, uh, that helps to calm down the inflammation because inflammation always is not a good thing. Lots of times we get inflammation which is uh, against viruses or non-harmful bacteria and that can cause more damage than good because of the cascade reaction it creates. So the foods that are naturally rich, if you're looking not for supplements but natural foods, that are rich in beta-glucans would be oats and barleys, mushrooms, and obviously yeast and seaweed. We don't do a lot of seaweed. 
people in Okinawa and Japan, in the lecture we did the blues on that, we talked about different locations. People in uh, Japan and the coastal areas of China, they consume a lot of seaweed, which is naturally rich uh, in beta-glucans. And these molecules promote longevity because they are reducing the inflammation. Inflammation, free radicals, those are the things that are causing damage to the cells, mutations, cancers, and whatnot. So this is all good stuff for, for the natural immunity of the body um, to live longer and healthier. So this is what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, uh, this is an excerpt from the CBS News where they reported about 2,154 visits and hospitalizations um, in a per I don't remember the institute there, uh, were the number of hospitalizations related to drug interactions with the supplement. So this is becoming an increasingly common problem, especially in the hospitals in the ER because people have falls, they have dizziness because of the interaction of certain non-regulated supplements with their prescribed medications. And as we tend to take more and more of these, the interactions are increasing. So something just to be mindful of, that is not always an electrolyte problem. It's not always the sodium, potassium, glucose, or infection. It can be a drug interaction that can go wrong and that can cause certain manifestations. Things to uh, obviously avoid all the time, uh, most of us probably are not doing this, which are considered super dangerous, are powdered caffeine. This is not your regular coffee. This is caffeine pills and powder, powder form, concentrated form of caffeine. It's said that one gram probably is as good as 28 cups of coffee, so obviously that's way more than Red Bull or anything like that, but uh, need to not do that. Uh, kava is another one, and yohum bean. Those are the main ones that are considered not safe anymore and should not be done uh, on a regular basis. Now, the, I call them the pills or the pretty little liars. There's three of them there uh, that we'll talk about. Uh, calcium, vitamin A, and E. Now, D with calcium is okay, but calcium by itself is not a good idea, is what I'm trying to say here. So we'll talk about just calcium supplements, or vitamin A and E, I think I have castigated enough, so I'll kind of uh, briefly cover. If anything we can take home from this slide is the idea that colored fruits and vegetables, the more brightly colored the fruits and vegetables are, the better they are for us because they contain all the antioxidants, all the phytonutrients which are naturally helping us to fight the infections and that's what we want. We want to have natural strong immune systems which can fight most viruses and bacteria and keep us healthy. So everything on the left is good for us and rich in vitamin A and that won't cause any problems. Carrots, bell peppers, uh, sweet potatoes, squash, everything with bright yellow, orange colors, those are great sources of vitamin A or retinol. Contains beta carotene, which is what we find in the supplements, but it also contains the other carotenes, the alpha, the delta, the epsilon carotene, and the balance and synergy we talked about. So please consume more of the fresh fruits and vegetables. You can boil it, you can steam it, you can eat it raw carrots if you would like, throw it in the blender in a smoothie, whatever way you like, but those are amazing sources. And the more we eat carrots and vitamin A sources, less the risk of cancer. What's the, what a paradox, and this is all proven in studies. Vitamin A and E supplements, chronic, long-term basis, are a risk factor. I'm not saying they're causing cancer right away, like if you take it for 10 years, you get cancer. They, they label it as a risk factor, which is increases the chances of having cancer. But natural sources, like carrots and vitamin E sources, they are protective against cancer and heart disease. Supplements cause the cancer and heart disease, and these natural sources are protective. So there's a balancing game here. We have to make sure what we need and not just, more is not necessarily good when it comes to supplements. Uh, quickly, uh, we'll talk about omega-3s. So, <clears throat> a brief background of chemistry about omega-3s. So omega-3s uh, represent the essential fatty acids. They represent fatty acids which are required by the body and not, cannot be synthesized by our body. So these are molecules called DHA and uh, the EPA. Those are the two main molecules, the eicosapentaenoic acid and docohexanoic acid, but these are basically fancy names of saying certain fatty acids that the body cannot make 
and we need to take from other sources. Mostly animal, like fish, like salmon, like uh, sardines and tuna and whatnot, but uh, they can also be found in plants. Some of them, especially the ALA or the alpha lenolenic acids, they can be found in plants, and those rich sources would be uh, flax seed, hemp seed, pumpkin seeds, almonds are great. So any of those sources are natural good sources. Uh, they say if you eat four nuts a day, that's the right amount. There's a Dean Ornish diet for weight loss and prevention of chronic medical problems. They say four nuts a day is the right amount of nuts to eat every day. Nobody can, I guess, stop at four, but then that's the... <laughs> That's the right amount to eat if you consume on a daily basis. At that point, they're healthy. Beyond that, there is excess of cholesterol and issues. So moderation is the key. Again, this is another slide from the PSTF task force. Uh, let's concentrate on the last green line here, which talks about people 65 and older. And they say the USPS has previously concluded uh, that vitamin D supplementation is effective in preventing falls in community dwelling adults, so people who live in their home, community dwelling, not institutionalized in nursing homes, uh, or older who are at increased risk of falls. So take home messages, okay with vitamin D, take it with the calcium, please don't take calcium alone. Now omega-3s for heart health, this is a very interesting slide. It's well known that omega-3s, the omega-3 fatty acids, they are anti-inflammatory, so they reduce the inflammation, which is a good thing. Chronic inflammation causes cancer, so we don't want chronic inflammation. There's anti-inflammatory diets and stuff like that. But at the same time, look at this beautiful study that was done in New England Journal in 2013. This compared people, and this is a huge study, this is not five people sitting in a room and deciding, okay, we'll, we'll misbrand omega-3s today. So this is 12,500 people. They had been randomly assigned into either uh, fish oil supplements, one gram daily, or placebo, which was olive oil. Keep in mind, olive oil is not a good source of omega-3s, it's a rich source of omega-6. So six is bad, three is good, that's established. The, the good ratio, they say, is four is to one. Uh, but our American diet has more like 25 is to one. Like we do 25 times more omega-6 than we do three. And oils are the main sources of omega. So when you say omega, you think of oils. What oils am I doing? Some are good, some are bad. The saturated ones are bad. They are rich in omega-6. Red meat is bad. It's rich in omega-6. So uh, the idea is to do more of the omega-3s, which is flax seed, hemp seed, chia seeds, basil, things like that, and less of the animal-based stuff, things like red meat, cholesterol-rich foods, or even like stuff like olive oil or coconut oil. So that's another topic, but uh, the study here, it randomized people into a group consuming olive oil, which is omega-6, and another taking the fish oil tablets. Guess what? They did not find these people had any reduction in the amount of heart attacks or cancer. So these people kept taking this uh, omega-3 one gram daily, which is the recommended dose, and they still, it did not reduce the death from heart disease uh, so it clearly proved that omega-3, same story like beta-carotene. Omega-3 is great when you consume it from natural sources, including fish. But it is not great, it's actually detrimental sometimes if it's uh, polluted, if it has those chemicals, the other ingredients. Uh, and it can cause, in some studies, it has increased the risk of cancer. So supplements is a very slippery slope. We have to make sure that we do not make any... Uh, easy cuts when it comes to our diet. Another thing, especially this will be, this will be something that uh, uh, the oncologist, the cancer doctors will mention to you. If you are undergoing chemotherapy for some sort of cancer or any family member is, please, please, please don't let them take omega-3s while they are on cancer therapy. Reason for this is very intuitive. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory, which means they subside the inflammation. If anything subsides the inflammation, it makes the blood thinner, which means people will bleed more. Cancer in general is a state of chronic inflammation. People with cancer, you'll hear, get blood clots in the legs, in the lungs. Why do they get that? Because it's chronic inflammation. So when you're giving them chemotherapy, you're killing the cancer cells. 
and you're inducing, if you add omega-3s to it, it's making the cells resistant to the kill. So not only they're having side effects from chemo, the chemo is not working. Because omegas are resisting the kill, and also they increase the risk of bleeding. So at least for the perioperative period, please consult your oncologist and ask about the risk factor uh, about omega-3s, whether you are considered a candidate or not. So I'm not talking about the natural sources again, which could be chia seeds, hemp seeds, or uh, flax seeds, or uh, almonds and other nuts. I'm just talking about the pills, the omega-3 pills, the fish oil pills even, because fish oil pills have been sometimes found to contain PCBs and other ingredients. And PCBs are carcinogens, they are cancer-causing molecules, uh, which the FDA does not like to be used in other, other ways, but if it's added to the nutritional supplement, there's no way to regulate it, so uh, people will have side effects without, without knowing. So vitamin E, quickly cover vitamin E here. Um, the good natural sources would be leafy green vegetables, avocados, almonds, peanuts, broccoli, olive and coconut oil. All those are great natural sources of vitamin E. Why do people take vitamin E? You would hear that as we go older we get Alzheimer's and some studies previously have proven that vitamin E helps to slow down the progression of memory loss. So if you're hitting dementia, it will slow down the progression. So here's the uh, clicker. The vitamin E studies that have shown that vitamin E helps to prevent dementia or delay the progression of onset of dementia only 200 days. So sooner or later, all of us will get there. Vitamin E just makes it 200 days later, if it works. <laughs> On the good days that it works, it's going to push it 200 days farther. Uh, with the side effects, obviously, increased cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, increased cancers, mostly of the lung. But uh, if we consume natural sources, no studies have shown that kale has led to Alzheimer's or kale has killed a person from heart disease. Obviously because it contains the natural molecules we've eaten in for years and I think we'll keep continuing doing that and not have any side effects because that's nature's way of nourishing the body. So the other studies obviously did not show that vitamin E made any difference. So most, uh, most specialists, neurologists will recommend against using vitamin E for memory. It doesn't help with memory restoration, that's what we know. So this is one of the last slides here, uh, pretty helpful slides. I'm, I apologize for the small size, I, I didn't realize uh, it won't like reflect very well. But basically, uh, this is a slide that shows, on the left side you have vegetables, herbs, fruits, mushrooms, legumes, whole grains, nuts and seeds. So these are the things which you should consume on a regular daily, soups and salads, fruits, fresh fruits and vegetables, grains, legumes. Uh, Dr. Foreman, he's a, a big plant-based diet uh, specialist, family physician. He came up with this mnemonic called G-bombs, which means you should every day consume elements which are contained in that acronym G-bombs. G stands for grains, B is beans and legumes, O is onions, M, mushrooms, B, berries, blueberry, strawberry, cranberry, whatever you want, and S stands for seeds. So again, greens, I'm sorry, grains, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. Everybody on a regular basis, more is good, should consume all the six elements because they would become containing all the essential vitamins, all the essential minerals, and most of the phytonutrients that we are requiring for our inflammation standpoint. So uh, not only it protects, as they say, the studies have shown the foods contain not only the essential elements, vitamins and minerals, which are extracted by the nutraceutical companies and put in the supplements, but they contain the naturally occurring phytonutrients. These are macromolecules that are fighting all the infection, fighting the cancer cells. So very important to consume natural fresh fruits and vegetables. Nature has given us teeth for a good reason, it's for chewing the food and swallowing the food. If, if nature meant us to just take supplements, the tongue would have been good enough, but for some reason God decided to put in teeth in our mouth, so we should, we should use to chew them and 
use all the fresh fruits and vegetables that we can lay our hands on. Dentures work too, but use them, is the idea. Okay, so the take home points from today's lecture. Supplements are helping, but mostly the big pharmas, unless you're taking vitamin D, sometimes omega-3 are fine. Uh, we talked about melatonin, folic acid, iron supplements, those are totally fine, but most other ones, are, are is a, a, probably a waste of money. Most of them you are peeing out in your urine, so hopefully they are not affecting. So vitamin B, C, those are being peed out in the urine. So if you take too much of that, it's probably not gonna hurt. You'll still be fine because the body has the mechanism. The kidneys are overloaded, but we still are peeing it out in the urine. Vitamin A, uh, D, E, and K. Those are four vitamins that the body cannot get rid of. It's stored in the liver, that's why People can have problems with the liver, liver toxicities, various drug interactions and stuff like that. So avoid the, as I call them, the pills of the pretty little liars. Uh, three pills, vitamin A, vitamin E, and calcium. Calcium just by itself, not in combination. Those should be avoided uh, unless your physician recommends them. If your doctor wants them, I'm not coming between you and your doctor. You, you probably should listen to your doctor. Uh, use your teeth because they're very good looking and probably functional so you can use them to chew the food and help break down the cell membranes to get the phytonutrients out of it and avoid what I call the fake foods. The fake foods are things that are just sitting on, on the counters, processed foods, granola bars, additives, preservatives, anything that is uh, that has a shelf life longer than my life, I try not to consume it <laughs> because it's, it's not good for me. Thanks a lot for coming today. I'll take any questions. I have two questions. Did you say olive oil was not good for you? Yes. It's not good for so you? So olive, any oil, so this is the idea. If you hear to someone called Mike Clapper, he has this SOS theory. Sugars, oils, salt. The less you do, the better you are. It's not just olive oil, then it's oil. It's not just olive oil, okay. it's all the oils. Olive oil is less of a problem. In Mediterranean okay. diet, olive oil is used a lot. So. Okay. It's less of a problem, but that study was done because olive oil is the healthy oil okay. to compare uh, the fish oil with the olive oil. But okay. olive oil is not as bad as some other oils are. So it's, okay. it's probably not as bad, but it contains omega-6. We want to bring down the consumption of omega-6 and increase omega-3s. <coughs> so that's why the less oil is better for us. Did you say vitamin B12 didn't have any food value? You couldn't get it from food, you had to get... Yes, yeah, so vitamin, e, uh, vitamin B12 is not synthesized by any <coughs> bacteria. I'm sorry, by any plant. It is synthesized by the bacteria living in the colon. So people, even if they eat meat, they get the vitamin B12. Because there's bacteria sitting in the cow's intestines, so we are getting the vitamin B12 that is synthesized, it's sitting in the meat. But if we are just vegans or vegetarians, which I am, then people can run into B12 deficiency because we are not eating soil anymore, which is containing the bacteria. So B12 is coming from bacteria. If you're not eating bacteria in the animals, then there's a problem. Nutritional yeast, fortified yeast does contain B12. That's a natural source because it's not a plant, it's yeast. Uh, so some yogurt might contain B12, but the best bet is to just get a shot or a pill once a day. It's pretty safe. Go ahead, Michelle. Rapeseed oil or grapeseed oil? Grapeseed oil. G or without G? G. So, I, I, in general, am against most of the oils because they are concentrated versions. Anything that gets concentrated, just think about corn. Corn and high fructose corn syrup. Same ingredient. Coca leaves and cocaine. Coca leaves, if you eat, nothing happens. Cocaine, if you eat, then you're in heaven. So there's, anytime anything gets concentrated, it's like isolated and chemically concentrated, it becomes uh, too toxic for the body because the body has not seen anything that concentrated. So I, I do not believe any of the oils, including olive oil or grapeseed oil, is good. If you can consume olives, not, nothing wrong with it. So uh, the idea is to consume more things which are natural and, and not the concentrated chemical versions. Yes, sorry, I did not go back to the slides. I think I skipped the slides somewhere. So basically, uh, 
Well, this is a good slide to stop at if you guys want to take a look. So calcium is bad. Why is calcium bad? There's uh, this theory of calcium bolusing, which means if you just take calcium, calcium tends to stick in the body. If it sticks in the, there's something you guys might have had if you go to cardiology, see your heart doctor, they might be doing what we call the calcium scoring, the coronary calcium score. So they put you through a CT scanner and take a look at the calcium burden in the blood vessels. That's called the calcium score. If it's more than 400, high risk of heart disease. Why is that? Because the plaques or the cholesterol plaques that we find inside the blood vessels, which eventually close and clog the blood vessels and people get heart attacks, the more calcium there is sitting on those blood vessels, more chances of formation of those plaques. And that's what gives us heart attacks. So if you take only calcium pills, all of that is sitting in the heart blood vessels and it's clogging up the blood vessels. That's why the calcium score goes up. That's one correlation. Second problem, people who consume lots of calcium, even people who take vitamin D with calcium, people should remember that will increase the risk of kidney stones. Most kidney stones are calcium derivatives, calcium oxalate kind of stones. Oxalic acid increases, calcium increases, that causes formation of stones. So we tell the patients, if you're getting recurrent kidney stones, Please don't take calcium and vitamin D supplements, at least for the periods you're getting it. Increase water intake, less of calcium. Third place in the colon. If you take too much of calcium, you get constipation. So it has, we have to be mindful that calcium tends to get deposited. It's one of those people like it overstays the welcome. So if you take something in your body, it's not leaving your body. It's like, be my friend forever. So. <laughs> We have to, uh, this is a good slide, I, I don't know why I, I skipped it. It talks about kidney stones. So if you think of proteins, why is milk bad? I did, I did not say please take calcium milk for calcium and vitamin D. Why is that? Because milk is acidic in nature. Foods can be acidic or alkaline. This is a chart that links the acidity or the pH of the foods. So things like green leafy vegetables, broccoli, they have a score of almost 9.9. .9. That's the alkaline nature of the food. Grapefruit, you'd be amazed. It's, it sounds like acidic, right? And grapefruit is still alkaline in the nature. So it's not just about the pH and the acidity, but what it does to the body. So fruits and vegetables, vegetables more than the fruits are alkaline, good for the body. Red meat, dairy is acidic. So what does it do? When you take acids, it will leach out the bones because it draws the calcium out from the bones. So there's some studies actually which have even said that milk can cause increased osteoporosis. I'm not saying all the studies. It's a very controversial topic now. We know for sure it's, it's similar to what we used to think with smoking and cigarettes. Like it was good for health, it was cool and would alleviate, alleviate the sore throat and whatnot. But we now know that nothing like that happens with smoke. Cigarettes are totally bad. So, Dairy and meat, we are going through a paradigm shift right now. More and more evidence is accumulating that long-term consumption of red meat and dairy is bad. Not only it causes chronic kidney disease, which I taught in the other lecture about where do you get your protein from. Uh, it is bad for the body because it causes cancer. So there's lots of studies about milk causing cancer, uh, prostate cancer in men mostly. And obviously red meat is known for years to cause colon cancer. So less is better. If you give less, the liver has a chance to clear it. The MPPGL we talked about. Liver still gets a chance to clear it out. If we consume meat three times a day, then we are overloaded with all the toxins. So some of us will get cancer, unfortunately. So calcium is bad if you're taken in lots of quantities and by itself. With vitamin D, it's a good deal because then it helps to excrete some of the calcium from the urine. So it kind of balances it out. But by itself, every day single calcium pill, especially 1,000 milligrams or more, is probably not a good idea. So, what's your thoughts on almond milk? So, <laughs> <laughs> all those are totally fine again. I'm, I'm totally fine with anything that's not containing. I'm, I myself have used milk for 30 years of my life and I stopped drinking milk like five years ago. But uh, almond milk is okay. Some people use silk milk. Those are natural versions that are not containing the antibiotics and the hormones that are being given to the cows and stuff like that. So it's naturally good. It doesn't taste the same. 
Some people are not a big fan of it, but I think it's totally fine as a replacement because almonds have much higher nutritional value than milk has. Moderation, milk is fine. Red meat is probably fine for most of us. Everyday consumption, lots of quantities are probably going to cause trouble. Yes, pork is red meat, venison is red meat, uh, beef obviously is red meat, yeah, okay. chicken is white meat, but in general meat is bad, red is considered worse than white. Okay. Do you recommend brewer's yeast? Yes, so brewer's yeast, baker's yeast, nutritional yeast, amazing sources. Okay. They are great sources of beta-glucans which helps to selectively shut down the inflammation. So inflammation can be good or bad. If we are being targeted by a bad bacteria, like C. diff or a pneumonia bacteria, we want our inflammation to be there, to have the white cells, the soldier cells, go to the site of infection, kill them. What if we have a virus like flu or something? The body is getting activated for no good reason. The virus is gonna leave the body anyway, but I'm seeing so many patients coming in the ear because they have cough and cold, because our immunity is not good. So. Actually, now that you ask me, a good way of fighting common colds and flu and all this congestion is to re is prepare this concoction. Just take a little bit of nutritional or brewer's yeast and add turmeric. Now, many people don't know what turmeric is. It's a yellow powder you can find in Walmart. Sometimes people can even buy the stocks, like the turmeric stocks, just like ginger stocks. You can get in Whole Foods and places like that. But turmeric powder, nutritional yeast or baker's brewer's yeast, Green, uh, ginger, black pepper, and a little bit of honey. Add all these ingredients with some water, just let it boil or simmer for a little bit, and just, just sip on it, like coffee or tea. And it has amazing anti-inflammatory properties, it has amazing health benefits, helps to restore the immunity. It's not the best tasting thing in the world, I mean it doesn't taste the same as coffee, but it does amazing for the immunity and in terms of building uh, your own natural resistance to viruses and the non-harmful bacteria. So those five ingredients in any proportion, uh, usually people will do more of the turmeric, like half a teaspoon, and just a little bit of the black pepper, because black pepper is uh, it's a little hot, I guess, but uh, the honey has some sort of modulating effect. So it's a great combination for common colds, cough, any of the sinus congestion that your second round of ZPAC or Augmentin is not able to clear. Is black pepper good for you? Black pepper is amazing. So there is some, a lot of studies, and I recommend a website, guys, if you get a chance. There's a, a guy called Michael Greger, nutritionfacts.org. If you just YouTube nutritionfacts.org or nutritionfacts, Michael Greger, G-R-E-G-E-R, he has amazing work. Some of his slides are, this, is, this slide is from Michael Greger's, by the way. He, he uh, does a lot of talks on YouTube and stuff like that. So basically, uh, black pepper increases the bioavailability, which means the amount the body can extract and use of turmeric. Turmeric in itself is good anti-cancer, known for a long time. Another great supplement is turmeric, by the way. I didn't talk about it. As long as it does not contain lead or arsenic. Turmeric is great. So natural stocks, Amazing. Powder, probably fine, but uh, just like nutritional yeast, turmeric is great. Black pepper increases the bioavailability of turmeric. So turmeric will be better absorbed, more effective, and the anti-cancer properties of turmeric will be amplified. So black pepper is great for metabolism. Another good thing is papayas, because they contain bromelain. That's a natural enzyme if you're having digestive problems. The uh, bromelain in the papaya helps to create better digestion. And I'm sorry, <laughs> bromelain in pineapple, papain in papaya. So papaya and uh, pineapple are two great uh, fruits and vegetables to have because they have great natural enzyme properties to digest the food. So IBS symptoms, abdominal cramps, they should be helping with that kind of symptoms. Alrighty, I, I guess thanks for, that was a great talk and great questions. Thanks a lot for coming to today's lecture. Hope to see you guys in the next one.